Hello and welcome to Town Meeting TV. My name is Jordan Mitchell and I'm joined today by Michael Colburn, uh, who is the current director of the Me Too Orchestra in Burlington and former director of the President's own United States Marine Band. So thank you for being here. Oh, thanks for having me, Jordan. If you want to please go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, as, uh, as you said, my name is Michael Colburn. Uh, my uh, history is primarily with the President's own United States Marine Band. But we moved, we might, being my wife and I, moved back here to Vermont in uh, 2022. We, we both hail from St. Albans, Vermont, um, and have enjoyed the professional opportunities that I've had, first with the Marine Band, but then also as director of bands at Butler University, and enjoyed both of those experiences, but, but frankly have really missed Vermont for many, many years, and finally decided uh, it was time to move back home, which we did in 2022. And my first professional opportunity after moving back here was to become the music director of the Me Too Orchestra in Burlington, which has really been a lot of fun. Great. What initially got you into music? Did you start at a young age, or was it something you picked up later in life? Well, my father was a high school band director uh, in uh, St. Albans, Vermont, for many years. Also was the commander of the 40th Army National Guard Band, based here in Burlington. Uh, so I grew up, you know, hearing music. My earliest memories are, are going to some of my dad's concerts. Uh, my my brother, uh, ten years older, was a tuba player, and my earliest musical memory actually is sneaking into his bedroom where he would keep his sousaphone occasionally, and I was probably three or four at the time and crawling up inside the sousaphone to make a sound on on the mouthpiece, which I just love the 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 volume and the depth of the sound. And so I really wanted to play the tuba. And so when it came time to pick instruments in fifth grade, um, I was set on the tuba and my father said, you know, you're 10 years old, you're not that big, you don't want to be lugging a tuba around at this age, why don't you start on the baritone horn, which is also called the euphonium. Uh, which is like a small tuba. In fact, in some cultures, it's called the tenor tuba. He said, well, you can start on that, it'll be easier to manage, and then when you get a little bit bigger, then you can switch to tuba. So I took his advice and started out on the baritone horn. Um, I was lucky that my, uh, my first band director, who actually plays in the Me Too Orchestra, his name is Randy Wheeler, um, was a bass trombonist. And so I had the privilege of having essentially private lessons right off the bat with, with Mr. Wheeler, as I knew him back in those days. First on the baritone, but then as I uh, got older and um, was curious about other instruments, he also had me play some tuba and trombone in lessons. And, and I really enjoyed those instruments, but there was something about the, the euphonium that I just loved. I, I loved the sound of the instrument. I like the parts that we got to play, especially with older music. The euphonium parts tend to be um, have a lot of the play the melody much of the time and have some very technically demanding parts. Um, and I also like the fact that it was a little exotic. You know, a lot of people didn't know what a euphonium was. You know, and so I like the fact that you know I played this instrument that wasn't quite as mainstream as these other instruments. Um, and uh, yeah, so euphonium was my first musical love. Um, when I was in junior high, I attended a summer music camp at the University of Vermont. It was a brass camp. And the guest euphonium clinician was a gentleman by the name of Lucas Spiros, who was the principal euphonium player in the president's own United States Marine Band. And that was the first time that I'd met a professional euphonium player. I didn't even know such a thing existed, right? And, uh, and I was this little kid, you know, seventh or eighth grade, uh, with this uh, little um, student model baritone horn. It had three valves and a bell that pointed forward. It's a very older, kind of primitive version of the euphonium. But, you know, uh, Mr. Spiros uh, treated me like I was, like all these advanced students that were there as well. And just very kind, very supportive, and a fantastic player. And I won't say that that was when I decided I wanted to try to be a professional euphonium player, but that's where the seed was planted. That's where I, I first started thinking, so that's an option, you know? Um, and as I made my way through high school, um, I was interested in lots of things. I, I love playing basketball, but when I realized I wasn't gonna make it past six feet, I thought, you know, a career in the NBA probably is not in, in, the, in the cards for me. Um, and I had other interests, but there was something about music that I kept coming back to. I, I just, I, I loved making music. I, I, as importantly, I never got tired of it. You know, other subjects I was interested in, but I, I, I've always felt like I, I have a very limited attention span, you know, and I just never saw myself in a nine to five desk job. I just thought I don't have the, the concentration for that. Um, but I never got tired of making music. And um, so I decided um, probably about midway through high school, I music I think is the way I want to go. 
and uh, started out as a music education major at the Crane School of Music in Potsdam, New York. Um, my dad knew that I had these professional uh, performing ambitions, but he said, you know, you'd be smarter to get a music education degree. And I, and I loved the idea of being a music educator. It wasn't like that was, uh, uh, you know, a, a major that I wasn't interested in. But my number one desire was to perform. And so after I was a music education major for about a year, I realized I, I just didn't have enough time to practice and prepare the way that I felt like I needed to if I was going to be competitive. So I changed my major to performance, and then it, I transferred to Arizona State University because there was a, a person there teaching tuba and euphonium who was highly recommended by everybody that I talked to. And so I transferred out to Arizona State as a performance major. I was fortunate to win a scholarship out there. Um, and he was the perfect person for me to study with. He really transformed me, not just as a, as a player, but also as a musician. And there's still many lessons that I learned from Mr. Parentoni, was his name, Dan Parentoni, that to this day when I'm studying a score, I still can hear his voice in, in my ear. And, uh, and those lessons I learned still help me to kind of shape a phrase. So, um, so I studied at Arizona State. Um, the very first euphonium audition I took was for the president's own United States Marine Band. That was the first vacancy that, that opened up. You know, this is one of the challenges as a, someone who wants to perform is, is to wait for those vacancies to occur. And the first one occurred with the president's own. So I was fortunate to win a position with that organization. Um, had no aspirations to conduct whatsoever. I just wanted to play my horn. But I uh, started working on a master's degree in conducting while I was in the president's own uh, because I thought if I'm ever looking for a college job, I need to have another set of skills that I can bring to the table. Um, but it was in the course of getting that master's degree that one of our assistant directors pulled me aside and said, hey, we've been watching you conduct and we like what we see. Have you ever thought about conducting here in the Marine Band? And you could have knocked me over with a feather because I thought, I'm not a conductor, I'm a euphonium player, you know? But I gave it a lot of thought, uh, talked to my wife, because this was very much a family decision about you know, whether to go that route. And we decided that, that this was worth pursuing, um, not just to become a conductor, but also to become part of the leadership of the Marine Band, which uh, I, I had grown to really care deeply about, you know, the organization, and more importantly, the people that made up that organization. And so I traded in my euphonium for a baton and really never looked back. Um, and that's how I, I got into conducting. Um, and one of the things that surprises people sometimes um, is that, you know, when they hear the Marine Band, they think of a concert band or, or a traditional marching band. But the Marine Band also has a chamber orchestra that uh, is, exists primarily to perform at the White House. So about a third of my conducting actually was with our chamber orchestra. So when I found out about the Me Too vacancy, I contacted Caroline Wooden, who is the executive director for the organization and asked if they might consider someone with, with my unique background and explained to her that much of my conducting was with chamber orchestra. And she said, well, this, that sounds very interesting. Why don't you go ahead and apply for the job? So I did and auditioned and here I am. Did you ever, so you played euphonium, did you ever, or even now, do you still think, what if I did tuba? It's a little heavier to carry around, but do you ever uh, dabble or do you? Do I, uh, I still love the tuba. I mean, to me, that is the, the and the uh, double bass is the equivalent. It's, to me, um, uh, any kind of musical structure is built on the foundation of those bass instruments. And there's just something about the power and, the, and, and just the, 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 um, the breadth of sound that, that the, those low instruments make. To me, that's where everything emanates from that. So I still love the tuba, but, but I fell in love with the euphonium. You know, euphonium gets to play melody a lot more often than the tubas do, you know, so that's kind of nice. Do you play any other instruments other than euphonium and, and conducting, if we consider that a instrument in a way. But. Yeah, well, it's, I'd like to consider it music making, although yeah. I point out to people the only thing on the stage that makes no sound is the conductor's baton, right? So it, it, people think it, it's this symbol of power, which it certainly is, but there's an irony that that's the only thing that is totally silent on the stage, right? But I also play trombone. Uh, I double majored in bass trombone as well as euphonium when I was in, in school and still play trombone a little bit. In fact, uh, just last night I was playing with our community band in St. Albans, which my wife and I still uh, we started playing in that group when we were both in junior high, and, and so it's fun to come back full circle and play with that ensemble again. But I always tell them, you know, I'm, I'm ready to play euphonium or trombone. In fact, I usually bring both instruments to the concerts and just find out where they need me. So, uh, so last night I was playing bass trombone with our band, which is a lot of fun. But those are my two primary instruments. 
Did you ever have an interest in composing, just as kind of a, a side question, or you prefer to keep I have it? no creative talent whatsoever, you sure know? You uh, well, it, it's nice of you to say that. Um, and in fact, I remember uh, I, one of my professors at Crane uh, became very much a, a mentor to me, a very influential figure. And, and early in my professional career, I was trying to figure out, you know, what to do, especially when I was considering diversifying my skill set and looking for a college job. And uh, and he said, have you, have you thought about composing? And and I said to him, his name was William Crowder. I said, Mr. Crowder, do you remember my my composition projects in, in your class? And he just gradually smiled and said, yeah, you're more of an interpreter than a creator. And I said, that's exactly right, you know? Um, and, it, I, you know, I, I wish I had that, that, uh, that creative skill. But really, my true love is interpreting music. It's, it's, you know, taking music that someone else has created and trying to make it sound as much, um, as close to what they imagined when they created it as possible. So you've kind of started to answer it, but what draws you to conducting? I imagine a little bit of that interpretation, but... Yeah, so um, as I said, you know, my, my first love was performance, you know, and um, as I started, you know, working as a conductor, I thought, boy, do I really have that skill set? Do I have that ability to work with others and help to kind of collectively shape, you know, this interpretation? And what really um, kind of gave me the sense that maybe I did was, was comparing it to what I did when I was playing music in a chamber music setting. So for uh, your viewers who are not familiar with that term, chamber music is a smaller ensemble often w that functions without a conductor. And so the musicians collectively decide and you know what the interpretation is gonna be. And I had a lot of experience as a chamber musician, of course, and, uh, and as I was standing on the podium in front of the Marine Band, I thought, you know, in many ways, I just feel like I'm still making chamber music. I'm just the chief collaborator, right? I'm the person that's helping to kind of shape what the musical message is going to be from the ensemble. And so whenever I would show up for a rehearsal, of course, I, I, I felt, you know, duty bound to have an interpretation in place, to know exactly how I wanted that music to go based on the hours of score study that go into preparing for that first rehearsal. You know, a lot of people, when they think of conducting, they think of what somebody does when they're standing there on the podium and they're, they're waving that baton, right? And they're communicating with the musicians and they think it's all about that. But what they don't realize is the many, many hours of study that happen before you set foot on that podium. It, it, you don't just stand on there and, and literally read this music and, and convey the message to the musicians. You have to do a bunch of work before that happens. And, and, and I love that work, you know, that, that studying of the score, of uh, studying music history, learning as much as you can about the composer and the context of that composition to understand what that interpretation should be, right? But when I would show up for that first rehearsal with this interpretation in mind, I was also listening to the interpretation that all of my players had in mind as well. And there would be times when I thought I knew exactly how I wanted a phrase to go and I would hear our principal cornet or our principal clarinet play it in a different way that wasn't exactly what I had envisioned but was so compelling that I thought, I like their idea better, you know? And when those players realize that I was open, because some conductors don't feel that way. Some conductors are like, it's, it's my way or the highway, right? When they realized that they were stakeholders in the process, that I was open to their interpretation as well. Now, still, you know, the buck stops with the conductor. You know, the conductor has to make decisions at the end of the day how things are going to go. But when those decisions are informed by the talent and the experience and the musicality of your players, and they realize that in many ways it is like a large chamber ensemble, then it becomes just this collectively joyful experience that is very different than the kind of autocratic approach to conducting. Yeah, that's a great interpretation. I don't conduct uh, at all. I play you know, I'm in the orchestra. I play the oboe, but um, that's the extent of my my music experience. So I think it's I like how you talk about it as you know how collaborative it is, but also interpretation and the interpretation changes over the course of rehearsals. Do you have uh, either a favorite composer or piece for band or for orchestra or for chamber groups? What music do you? Like. Uh, I always have a hard time with that, what is your favorite dot, 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 a because favorite. Um, my favorite music is often whatever I'm working on at the moment, you know, um, and and I really try whatever I'm conducting to invest myself as totally, completely in in that music as I, as I possibly can. Um, 
you know, th there are, you know, in, in band music, I love the music of uh, Percy Granger and Gustav Holst, John Philip Sousa, of course. Um, but when it comes time to like, you know, pick a favorite composer or a piece, I, I just, I can't do it because I just love too much. And, and I love all different types of music. This is one of my favorite things about my Marine Band experience was that we were playing, you know, great classical music, you know, traditional concert band music, orchestra music by all the great composers. But then we also had opportunities to work with musicians like Beyonce and Kelly Clarkson or Aretha Franklin, um, Ray Lemontain, you know, just the, these great musicians from different musical walks of life and hearing and seeing their craft and having a chance to make their music with them was just a thrill. And, um, and, and one of the things that made that job so interesting, there was, I don't think I ever had a, bo a boring day at work in the Marine Band, I can tell you that. Mm, I bet. Um, and so you, you joined the President's Own Marine Band in 1987, at the time as a euphonium player, <coughs> and then later on you became the director in 2004, retiring 10 years later after that. Can you talk a little bit more about what that experience was like? Because it's pretty unique to um, be able to play in a, in a group like that and to direct a group like that. So. Yeah, I mean, it, it um, as I said, there was never a boring day. You know, I spent nine years as a player, um, was promoted to principal euphonium in 1990, uh, my third year in the band. So I had chances to play solos, you know, um, in Washington, D.C. and on our national concert tours. Those tours are, are terrific because as much as we love playing concerts in Washington, D.C., the residents of that city are used to really good band music. You know, you've got the premier bands from the, the Army, the Marine Corps, the Navy, the Air Force, right there in Washington, D.C. And so I won't say they take us for granted, but it's less of a unique experience, an unusual experience to, to you know, attend one of those concerts in D.C. But when we go on tour, you know, we're on a, basically a five-year rotation of covering the entire country. And we try to play every nook and cranny when we go on tour. And so in some cases we'll be playing, you know, beautiful concert halls like Carnegie Hall, you know. But in many communities we're playing in a, a field house or a gymnasium. You know, it's whatever is the best venue for that community. And as much as you might think, oh, I bet you the band really loves to play a place like Carnegie Hall, which we certainly do, in many ways our favorite tour memories are in those field houses and gymnasiums because we play those concerts that the lights stay up, right? You, we can see the audience. When we're playing in a, in a formal, formal concert hall, it's dark, you know? We have no idea who's out there, you know? But in those gymnasiums, we can see all the people who are there. We can see how excited they are. We can see those grizzled World War II veterans, you know, getting to their feet out of a wheelchair when they hear the Marines hymn because that's what Marines do. They stand at attention when they hear the Marines hymn. We can see the look on their faces when we play the Stars and Stripes, which we do right toward the end of the concert. And, and you can kind of feel just this explosion of energy because you know they've been waiting for that. You know, from the very first note we played, they're, they're waiting for the Stars and Stripes. And so when they finally get it at the end of the concert, it's just intense. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, so those experiences were terrific. But then, of course, our primary mission is to provide music for the White House. So. In addition to the public concerts and, of course, the ceremonies that we do for the Marine Corps, including uh, full honors funerals for fallen Marines at Arlington National Cemetery, which is one of our most important and most sacred responsibilities. You know, those, those experiences are incredibly moving. But the chance to make music at the White House is pretty cool because you just never know who's going to be there, uh, who's going to be listening to your music. Um, I remember one time um, we did the theme from Schindler's List and um, we hear this little smattering of applause and turn around and there's John Williams and Steven Spielberg who had been in a receiving line but were so moved by hearing us play their music that they wanted to come out to personally thank the musicians. And so that makes you sit up a little straighter and play a little bit better when you know that you have no idea who is listening to, to your piece. In fact, my first experience conducting our orchestra at the White House was in 1996 during the Clinton administration. And I was a nervous wreck. I mean, I, I will tell you, I got butterflies every time I walked into the White House. Even though I'd gone there hundreds of times by the end of my career, I, it's still, every time I walked in there, it was just a thrill. And so that my first time conducting the orchestra, we were doing um, an orchestral setting of Ray Fun Williams' English Folk Song Suite. It's a, it's a work that he wrote for band originally, but there's a wonderful uh, uh, arrangement by Gordon Jacob for orchestra. So we were in the middle of the first movement, and uh, I felt a little tug on my elbow, and I turned around expecting to see somebody from the White House staff, and it was President Bill Clinton himself. 
who had come out of the, the blue room uh, over into the foyer. And, uh, and he said, this is the English folk song suite. And this movement is uh, 17 come Sunday, but the next movement is my Bonnie boy. And in that, and, and the band version, the oboe has a solo, but in the orchestra version, is it the violin? You know that oboe solo, do, you know I what I'm talking well, about. Yes. <laughs> so he wants to talk shop, right? And now again, I'm a newly minted conductor at the White House for the first time, a nervous wreck already. And suddenly I'm trying to conduct and talk to President Clinton about this piece, you know? But, um, as I reflected on this after, you know, I answered his questions and successfully navigated the band, the orchestra through the piece, I get thinking, you know, he couldn't have had any direct contact with that piece for decades. You know, the last time he probably had any contact with this piece was when he was playing it as a tenor sax player in high school, probably at an Allstate or something like that, you know, but he still remembered all these years later the names of the movements and which instruments had the solos. I mean, he, he had that all locked away in that amazing brain of his. And he was actually a very talented musician. Um, as I mentioned, he played tenor sax. I had heard that he'd thought about becoming a band director before he decided to go into politics because he loved music that much. So there's another example of playing music at the White House um, in a setting where you are just providing atmosphere. You know, so many times when the chamber orchestra is playing at the White House, we're almost like musical wallpaper, right? You know, we're just providing elegance to these events and that, that uh, that bed of music tends to make people feel more comfortable and as I said, it just adds this, this air of, of sophistication and elegance to any event. And so it's easy to start thinking, eh, is anybody really listening to us? You know, nah, they're probably not paying it. They're all talking to each other and you know, it's a social experience. But then when you find out, not only is someone listening, but it might be the president, it might be John Williams. We, I remember other events, well I remember toward the end of my career we were doing a medley uh, of West Side Story and the way we were positioned in the foyer, I'm facing the fireplace and the musicians are looking out at, at the foyer. And we were toward the end of this medley, it was the uh, America tune. bim bum bum, right? And I'm conducting and I can tell that none of the musician, musicians are looking at me. They're all looking out at the foyer, you know? And I thought, okay, well something's going on here, right? So I, I finished up and I leaned over to our concert master and I said, so what were you guys all looking at? And she said, well, Rita Moreno was dancing in the foyer. She was at this event. And of course she was in the, you know, the original production of, uh, of West Side Story. And so, yeah, she was out there dancing. Uh, uh, and, and so I didn't blame the musicians for being a little distracted and not looking at me, but looking at her instead. But it was just, you know, another example of you just never knew who was going to be at a White House event and how they were going to respond to the music that we were playing. Yeah, that's great, great stories. And I imagine now conducting, um, you know, back home in Vermont, you kind of have that in the back of your head. Is, you know, if the Me Too Orchestra is playing Contours Auditorium in Burlington City Hall, you don't know who will be there. Um, so that's, that's great. I, I carry those uh, memories with me. I'll, I'll never forget them. But, you know, honestly, I, I just, uh, I, I love making music with any group that is excited and enthusiastic about making music, you know? That's really what, it, that's, to me, that's the real joy. And as, um, as director of the President's Own, you were also the music advisor to the White House. Do you have any favorite experience of someone, you know, helping you with input that maybe on music, I was like, oh, sure, I yeah. know about music and have some, you know. So, um, yeah, that's, that's one of the titles that goes with being director of the Marine Band is that you're the music advisor for the White House. And people mm -hmm. often want to know, so wh how involved are you? What does that mean, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, what that means is that um, our primary point of contact with the White House for social events is the social secretary. And uh, um, that's a position that's been in place for many, many years, basically coordinating all those receptions and social events that happen at the White House, often which involve music. And the social secretary is often someone who does not have a real musical background themselves. And, um, and so whenever there's a new administration, one of the first things that we do is ask for basically an, uh, an hour or two of the social secretary's time and we bring all of our musicians over to the White House and present what we call a Marine Band Showcase where we show them all the different kinds of music that we can provide for the White House. So when we get a tasking from the White House, it can be something as simple as a solo pianist playing in the private quarters. Uh, it might be a string quartet. Um, it may be a, a jazz combo. It may be um, something as large as a, as a huge band on the south lawn of the White House for a, a formal arrival or for another social event. Or as I said, it might be our chamber orchestra playing in the, in the foyer. 
but often it's specialty events. So the Marine Band has um, uh, can put together, uh, we've gotten requests for a mariachi ensemble, mariachi ensemble for Cinco de Mayo, um, an Irish ensemble for St. Patrick's Day. We get a request once for a, a klezmer ensemble, and this was on short notice. Um, well, they, they asked for an event that was going to be appropriate for, uh, for I think it was a Hanukkah event. <clears throat> and, no, actually, I think it was a different Jewish reception that was happening at the West, but they wanted music that was going to be appropriate. And so I put the word out to our musicians, and we had a clarinet quartet that had just done an all klezmer ensemble. So we were able to, able to send them over to play this music, you know, at the White House. So... Um, Often these ensembles are put together with musicians, our musicians who are um, employing secondary skills. So we've got, there are 154 people in the organization. About 130 of those are uh, performing musicians. Wind, brass, and percussion, as you would expect with a Marine band, but also string players. And we also have um, some uh, players who specialize in jazz. And um, so we kind of mix and match our musicians from that pool of, within that pool of musicians. And uh, as I started to say, a lot of those musicians are employing secondary skills. So for example, we have a, a country ensemble called Free Country. And for many years, the lead singer in that ensemble was one of our French horn players. And if we ever advertised for a French horn player that could sing country western music, we. Nobody would show up for that audition, right? But we just happened to have this French horn player who loved singing country music and had this this uh, this secondary skill set that she was willing to to share. And so my message to the social secretary was always, you know, please ask us first. Believe me, we'll tell you if we can't do it. But chances are we can probably take care of most of your musical needs. And uh, one time she called over, um, this was during the Bush administration, uh, and asked for a, uh, a bagpipe band. And I said, okay, you got me there. We cannot provide you with a bagpipe band. But, uh, but we helped put her in touch with some people who could take care of that need. That's great. So after you wrapped up your time there, you um, then served as director of bands at Butler, uh, at Butler University. And so how is your experience um, you know, teaching young adults and students? It was fantastic. You know, um, I mentioned that my dad was a high school band director. My mom was an elementary educator. So I come from educators. I strongly believe in public uh, school education and music education. Um, and I had often thought, you know, post-Marine Band, uh, I felt like I had um, a lot of energy yet to give, um, a lot of music that I still wanted to make. Um, and thought it, it, it'd be interesting to see if I could do that with students, you know. And honestly, I was kind of curious to see if I could build a program because the Marine Band was already pretty good and pretty well known when I took over as director. So I really felt like, you know, mission one for me was to just not screw that up, right? Um, and I'm proud of the fact that, that we had, uh, during my 10 years as director, the organization really did continue to grow and flourish and, and find new ways to kind of uh, serve the American public. So that was a great source of pride. But as I said, they were already fantastic. And uh, when I got to Butler, um, Butler has a really strong uh, history and tradition in, in uh, uh, of music education. But uh, when I got to the program, the, the numbers were a little bit lower than they had been historically, and so there was interest in trying to build that back up again. So um, that was really a new experience for me to try to build something that, that really did need more care and attention, uh, and it was a ton of fun. Uh, I had a great time working with the students there. Um, part of the, I think, the secret to my happiness and their happiness was for them to understand that I did not expect them to sound like the Marine Band. In fact, the, the day of my first rehearsal with the Butler Wind Ensemble, I said, the first thing you guys need to know is I don't expect you to sound like the Marine Band because that wouldn't be fair to you and it wouldn't be fair to me because these are students. These are much younger people, you know, than I was dealing with with professional musicians in the Marine Band. But I said, you know, and I alluded to this earlier in our interview, for me, this the joy and satisfaction uh, in music is... Um, is working with a group of people who are enthusiastic about making music. And that's what I found to um, uh, a great degree at, at Butler. Um, the people in the Marine Band, of course, they love making music as well, but they're professionals. They've been doing it for a long time, so it's not new. It's not that, that thrill of experiencing something new is not as likely to happen with professional musicians as it is with students. <clears throat> and so working with the students at Butler, um, 
I, I, I can still picture in my mind, in my memory, the, the, the joy and excitement on their face when we'd have one of those moments where everything would align, everything would come together, you know, and I would kind of describe what our objectives were. And when we got there and they could hear that we had gotten there, seeing how excited they were was just an, an adrenaline rush for me, you know. And, uh, and for me as a conductor, and this is true of every ensemble I work with, there is the, the goal of, uh, there's the first rehearsal, and how things sound at that first rehearsal, and there's the concert, and how much progress can we make from that first rehearsal to the concert, and then from that first concert to the next concert, and from that concert, and so this is how we build, right? And, um, and hopefully you've sent some of this in your experiences with me too, you know, that, that chance to really kind of get to know each other as an ensemble and to, and to keep building and raising our expectations and seeing how, how far can we go. And, um, and I, I experience this over and over again when I'm working with students in all state festivals, those kinds of things, when I'm even working briefly with uh, university ensembles when I'm there to do uh, a residency, you know to see how much we can accomplish during that time together. And, um, and, and again, to see that excitement, to sense the, the exuberance and, and the thrill that they get from, um, as I would say with my Butler students, we're never gonna sound like the Marine Band, but how close can we come, right? You know, how close can we come to sounding like that? Um, and and, and they, could, they could sense that. I remember uh, finishing up my fourth year there and uh, one of my flute players was graduating and she'd been in my ensemble for eight semesters. And she said to me, you know, Professor Colburn, I remember you talking to us about that in that first semester and, and that growth every concert, every semester. And she said, it happened. I, I, during my eight semesters, I saw that happen. And it was just so exciting to be part of that. So. So it, as you can tell, I get every bit as excited about making music in a music educational setting as I do in a professional setting. Um, so yeah, I just love making music. That's wonderful. And then, so after that, you came you came back to Vermont, as many people do, and welcome back. Uh, I'm not a Vermonter, but uh, I'm from New York and went to school here and don't know if I'll leave anytime soon. It's a, Good. It's a great place to be. Um, and now that you're here, you do many other things, but one of the things you do is you conduct the Me Too Orchestra in Burlington. Um, you've worked with for the last two years. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that group? Sure. So I talked a little bit about um, uh, applying for the job uh, back at the beginning of the interview, but uh, I was still director of bands at Butler, and uh, as I often did during my downtime, I was reading the Burlington Free Press online and saw this advertisement for a group called Me Too that was looking for uh, a new director. And so I thought, hmm, I've never heard of this group before. Um, so I did a little research and uh, be became acquainted with the mission of this group, which of course is um, to, to serve uh, the mental health through music, right? You know, uh, music can be such a wonderful resource for those especially struggling with, mu with mental health issues, but music, it can be a double-edged sword. Music can also be a source of stress, stress and anxiety for those who want to make music but find it difficult in conventional mu settings, uh, especially if they're wrestling with a, a mental health diagnosis, to do that in a way that really is as beneficial to them as they as they need. And so becoming acquainted with this mission, I thought this this really sounds intriguing. So I reached out to Caroline Whidden, who I mentioned is the executive director, and, and asked if she might be interested in somebody with my background. And she said, absolutely. And then as we talked more about this, she said, well, Mike, have, how much experience have you had you know, in dealing with musicians who are, are wrestling with these kind of mental health issues? And I said to her, you know, Carolyn, I don't think I've ever conducted an ensemble where I didn't have musicians who were dealing with these kinds of struggles. And I said, you, know, you might think in the Marine Corps, people think of big, strong, tough Marines, and they don't equate that with mental, mental illness, mental health issues. But I said, I, we had a horn player who was diagnosed with schizophrenia when I was an assistant director. And trying to help him find, the, of course, the, the help and support that he needed, but to try to figure out what we could do as an organization. We had uh, musicians who were struggling with addiction issues. You know, we had musicians who were di diagnosed with focal dystonia, which essentially is um, a, a, a nerve issue um, that, that prevents people from being able to play their instruments. I had a, an associate principal horn player who was one of the finest musicians we had in the organization, showed up for one a rehearsal one day and literally could not play her horn. And uh, so helping her, again, to get the resources that she needed and the, had the support that she needed 
um, was really a very important thing for us in, in our organization. And then when I transitioned into music education, when I was at Butler, had many musicians who were dealing with mental health issues and problems. Um, and to see not only the university support those students, but to see how the students themselves would support one another, I, I just found to be inspirational. Um, we uh, had, a, a, again, a horn player. I don't know why I'm, I keep coming back to horn. I mean, it's not that instrument. You're um, a brass player. Yeah, yeah. but uh, who uh, uh, was autistic and a uh, very fine horn player, but uh, was given to uh, uh, having some uh, kind of violent, violent outbursts verbally uh, during rehearsals. And to see how um, unflapped our students were by that and how supportive they were, you know, for this student, uh, again, I, I, I found to be inspirational as, as a teacher and as a leader. And I thought, and it gave me great faith in the future of our society, seeing uh, how supportive our students were of this student who was in need. So I said to Caroline, I, I, I haven't been in an organization that has specifically served that need as Me Too does, but it's always been part of my own personal experience and personal mission um, to make music as welcoming as possible. Um, and so to learn that you know, one of the, 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 the mottos of Me Too is that it's a stigma-free zone, I think it's wonderful you know, that we're making music in a non-judgmental way, that we want to welcome everyone to the table. And to find an organization like Me Too that has, of course, a number of musicians who are, who are dealing with these kind of diagnoses themselves, but also, as you know, many of our players are there to kind of support the cause. They're, they're allies. We have people in the, the professions like psychology that, that certainly understand our mission and want to support that. But others who have family members or friends who are dealing with these kinds of diagnoses and so are there to, as I said, support the cause. And so to be part of that um, is uh, such a meaningful way for me to make music in, in this most current chapter of my life. And how do you think music helps to kind of fulfill the mission of Me Too? But um, I think music is um, kind of a unique activity. You know, some people, not, I feel like not many people, I mean young people as a young person are as involved in it anymore in, in making classical music. So how do you find that music helps, um, you know, support those people? So music, uh, one of the things I love about music is that it can be and often is a very solitary experience, you know. So I talked about my hours studying a score as a conductor and that to me equates to the hours I spent practicing my euphonium uh, alone in a practice room, you know, for hours and hours a day. So part of it is very solitary, especially if you really want to advance on your in, in your instrument. But the to me the payoff is that it's also a social experience, you know. It's it's all well and good to make music by yourself and there's a satisfaction in that. But then when you carry that into an ensemble, whether it's a chamber ensemble, whether it could be something as simple as playing duets, but a chamber ensemble or even a, a larger orchestra, that chance to make music with others and to adjust your own playing, your own craft with other people in real time, to me there's nothing like it. You know, and as much as I love conducting, and my, I've never been able to really recover my skills as a player. As I mentioned, I still play in our community band, but I've, I've got my, some playing issues myself but I still can't set my instrument down. I still go back to it every day thinking, you know, today's the day I think that I'm, it's gonna to start to sound better, you know? And that chance to play in an ensemble, you know, to, to again, adjust to what's going on around me. You know, when I was talking about experiencing that as a conductor and relying on that as a conductor, to go back and do that now as a player reminds me of, of how exciting that is to be in there shoulder to shoulder, literally with other people and playing and, and, and of course offering something, you're, you're, you're putting your playing out there for others to listen to, but you're also listening to others and adjusting the way that you play in real time, whether that's intonation, you know, you may think you're in tune, but it doesn't sound good, and so you adjust up or down until it does sound good. It's not a matter of being right or wrong, it's a matter of how good can I make this ensemble sound with my own playing. Adjusting articulation, style, all those other things that make <clears throat> interpretation such a fun and exciting thing to do. And the chance to do that as an active participant. You know, you mentioned a lot of people, they may listen to music, but they don't make music. And boy, they're missing out on a, a, a big part of what's so joyful about music. Of course, we'd love to listen. We want listeners. We want audience members, right? But 
I think if you're also a player, it enriches your experience as a listener because suddenly you're listening in an entirely different way. And as I said, if you're not if you're not playing music, you're missing out on just this wonderful experience to to actively engage with people in real time that is is just so special. I agree. People are missing out <laughs> if they're not playing. Um, but there's ways for people to get involved. Absolutely. Um, so I I play in the Me Too Orchestra, so I kind of know the answer to this. But um, you know what events are coming up for Me Too, and then we'll talk a little bit about how folks can get involved. But um, we have the fall, you know, fall and spring. What's coming up for Me Too? So uh, Me Too, our our rehearsal and concert schedule basically follows the academic year. So we start in September and we finish up in May. We generally do three concerts per year. Th concert programs, there may be multiple performances, but we do uh, a concert usually in November, March, and May. And uh, so we generally spend probably somewhere between eight and 12 rehearsals preparing a concert. And we have uh, a membership uh, with widely ranging skills. Um, and so I try to program accordingly. So we've got some music that may be a little tough for some of our players in the folder, but our attitude always is play the notes that you can play. We have enough talent in the group, enough people who are comfortable with all of the notes that just play the notes that you can play. And then if you keep doing that, you're gonna find that from rehearsal to rehearsal and concert to concert, you're playing more and more notes, right? So there are no auditions required to play in Me Too. Um, so if you're interested in playing, even if you haven't played your instrument for a while, I encourage you to go to our website. Uh, I think the website's on the screen here so people can see how to do that. Uh, to get in contact with uh, Phoenix uh, Crockett, who is our manager um, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, Me Too Burlington Orchestra. And he can uh, let you know, you know, wh what is possible for you, what instruments we're still looking for. You know, there's some sections where we do have to kind of cap it at a certain point. But we're, uh, certain sections, especially our string sections, we're always looking to augment. Um, and as I said, even if you're a player who hasn't played in a while or has just started taking lessons and is looking for some ensemble experience, even if you just come in and sit in on a rehearsal or two, I mean, there's no obligation. So you can, uh, you know, drop in and, and, and play for a few rehearsals if you just want to kind of get, some, you know, a sense of what that experience is like. But it is truly a stigma-free zone. Um, it, we're not going to sit in judgment of your playing. Uh, we uh, love the idea of working with play, players of, of varying levels and uh, just, you know, uh, think that experience of, of live music making is something that once you start doing it, you're just not going to want to stop. Absolutely, and there's also, uh, and so uh, the Me Too organization uh, was originally based in Burlington, but is now based in Boston. So there's also, if folks happen to be watching from Boston, Massachusetts, there's also um, a, I think there's a flute group and an orchestra in, in and Boston. And a choir. And a choir in, yep. in Boston. And there's also an orchestra in Manchester, New Hampshire, too. Yes. So, yeah. Other, yeah, other ways to get involved. Um, and then in Burlington, so the orchestra has been around for many years, I think over 10 years mm -hmm. um, before both of our time, but it's been around for a while. They're also starting a chorus this fall um, and rehearsals will be in the Burlington area in South Burlington and kind of a, a trial this fall. So if people don't play an instrument but still want to be involved musically, there's another another way to get involved. So you started music as a young at a as a young person at a young age. What advice would you give to a young person looking to either pursue pursue music in education or in conducting or in performance? Or what would you tell your younger self? So uh, careers in music um, are not as uh, generally lucrative as some other careers. Um, and so what I often tell people who are kind of wrestling with this decision. Um, you, you, you need to really have a burning desire to do it, whether it's teaching it or performing. Um, if you don't have a passion for music, you're likely to burn out because these uh, performance, performing jobs are hard to get and they're quite demanding. And, uh, and music education is a very demanding career as well. My, my dad was a high school band director. I saw how hard he worked. Um, and, uh, and stood in admiration, you know, of that. Um, but what kept him going through all of that was his passion for music and for his students. And um, so I think that really is the, the first thing you need to have in place. You know, you, if you don't have that, chances are you're going to decide at some point, you know what, maybe music's not for me. 
Um, if you have that, of course, that's not a guarantee of success, you know, especially with performing jobs, they're hard to get. Um, I was very lucky to land a job, um, but I had many good friends who I felt were just as talented, if not more talented than I was, who never had that opportunity. So you need to understand that that's the case. And whether you want a life in music as a performer or as a teacher, you may have to be a little more creative and entrepreneurial about it, um, especially these days where uh, there's downsizing happening uh, in so many areas that affect music, whether it's perform uh, you know, professional performing organizations or education. And you may have to kind of stitch together a career uh, in a number of different ways, whether that's through private teaching, um, you know, freelancing, uh, looking for other educational opportunities as you can. Uh, it is going to take a, a certain amount of creativity and patience. Um, but again, at the root of that, if, if you just can't imagine a life without music, you know, then you're going to find a way to make it work. And that really is the key. And thank you. And so we've covered a lot. Your, your musical career at the Me Too Orchestra in Burlington. Is there anything else we didn't talk about that you want to share before we wrap up? No, well, actually one thing I would say is, um, of course, we love having audiences for our performances. So uh, even if you don't want to perform in Me Too, I encourage you to check out our website so you can learn more about our mission. And I encourage you to come to our concerts, which are not only uh, musical showcases, but they're also opportunities for our musicians to give testimonials about their own journeys and their own experiences in dealing with mental health issues. And I know from having talked to friends of ours that have come to performances, uh, how moving they have found that experience to be, not only musically, but, but hearing those firsthand accounts really reminds people of uh, how much people are suffering all around us, our friends, our neighbors, our families. Um, so to hear that message, I think, is an important reminder, but also to hear how important music can be as a su source of support and solace to them. Um, and, uh, and it's just one of the many great powers of music, I think. Great. Thank you. Um, so thank you for being here and also for bringing the joy of music to so many people. Um, and so folks who are interested in learning more the, about Me Too, their website is metoomusic.org. And that's me, like the number two, music.org. Um, and there's information about the Burlington Group as well as throughout the rest of the Northeast. Uh, you can also find recordings of the Me Too Burlington Orchestra that uh, Town Meeting TV has recorded on our website, and that's at cctv.org. Um, thank you for being here, and thank you for this interview, and thank you for watching Town Meeting TV. Thank you, Jordan.